Thermal conductors and insulators are used to control the flow of thermal energy. When you're out on a cold day, you want to control the flow of thermal energy and keep it from leaving your body. That's why you wear a jacket. In this video, we'll define what thermal conductors and thermal insulators are, and we'll look at numerous examples of them so you can identify them on your own, use them in your projects, and use them in real life. Starting off, a thermal conductor is a material that is good at conducting thermal energy. A thermal conductor is a material that is good at conducting thermal energy. Something you should note, in general, metals are excellent conductors, while plastics, wood, and fluffy materials are pretty awful conductors. So metals, great conductors, and I'm going to explain why. A metal, if you were to look at it very uh, microscopically, like at the atomic level, you would see that metals are really close together. The atoms are really closely and tightly packed together. And gases, on the other hand, are really spread out. So my gas is going to be kind of like all spread out across the screen here. And so if we were transferring thermal energy into this metal, this is our metal on the bottom here, if we were to transfer thermal energy to one side of it, then that particle would absorb the energy, almost like kicking a soccer ball, you know? And then that particle would transfer to this particle, and this particle, and then this particle, and it would go right on down the line, kind of like Newton's cradle, you know, those little balls that go back and forth. That's exactly what's sort of happening here, and that's why metals are great conductors, is because the particles are so close together. Whereas in a gas, they're not close together. So if I were to transfer thermal energy into this particle, then it would probably like bounce into this one, and then this one maybe, and then it would go way over here. Who knows? You know, just since they're all spread apart, it takes a long time for the thermal energy to transfer through them. So in general, metals, great conductors, gases, not so much. And I put a few examples here to illustrate this for you. One being a toaster. If we want our toast to get hot, you know, we're going to run the electricity, the energy through some metal so that it transmits it to the toast. Excellent conductor inside of a toaster. This blacksmith probably was working on a piece of metal down here in the bottom left, and it's glowing hot. And, you know, blacksmiths have to wear super um, protective gloves, and they have to use tongs because even though this part of the, the rod is red hot, the thermal energy will transfer all the way up and travel up this rod into the blacksmith's hand. So you got to like make sure that even though it doesn't look hot, it is hot because metal metals are great conductors. The heat's going to travel through them. Same thing with a pot. If you were to heat a pot that had a metal handle, the thermal energy is going to go up from the fire into the metal pot and then travel all the way up into the metal handle, which will burn you. It doesn't happen instantly, but it, it takes a little while. But the thermal energy travels really well through metals. And sometimes, you know, you might be sitting on a bleacher and you might notice that the bleacher is really cold for some reason. Like if you're at a, a winter game or even a game where it's like room temperature, you know, outside it's like 70 degrees. For some reason, the bleacher feels cold. And you're like, why is that? Uh, metals are generally cold because when you touch them, it's almost like touching an ice cube. Since they're really good conductors of thermal energy, when you touch them, they conduct thermal energy away from your hand. And that's why you feel cold. It's just like when you hold an ice cube, the ice cube sort of sucking energy out of your hand, which makes you feel cold, and metals do the same thing. And then this last, these last two pictures up here were from a trip I took to Italy a couple years ago, and I went in the hotel room and I got so excited because there was a radiator. And a radiator is a heating system, actually, and hot water comes in from pipes and it goes through this little lattice, or this little sort of maze of pipes, and it heats the room. And it's made out of metal because metal is a great conductor of thermal energy. So the thermal energy from the water, you know, gets transferred into the metal and then transfers it into the air of the room, which heats the room. And then I got even more excited because I went to the bathroom and there was a towel heater. It was a towel rack that had hot water running through it and it heated the towels. It was amazing. Next up, we have insulators. Insulators are the exact opposite of conductors. They are poor conductors of thermal energy. They actually block thermal energy. They're kind of like a wall for thermal energy, which is kind of nice because we don't always want thermal energy to leave. We want to keep it and we want to use it. And so in the case of staying warm in the winter, you wear a jacket, which is made out of nice fluffy feathers, sometimes, um, or just some sort of fabric or whatever. But that fabric has a lot of air in it. It's very fluffy. Air is a poor conductor. It's a good insulator. And so that's why we wear jackets to keep the heat inside of our bodies. Cardboard is also a good insulator. It's not amazing, but it's pretty good. And if you look close, a close picture of cardboard, you'll see that some cardboard is corrugated, meaning that it has these corrugations in them or this, these little gaps, 
which is air. Air is a good insulator. So if we can make a structure that somehow has some air pockets in it, that's generally going to be a pretty good insulator. Wood is the same way, except you can't see it very well, but if you look at wood underneath a microscope, this is, I think, 200 nanometers or something like that, 200 nanometers or micrometers, very, very small, very, very zoomed in. But you can see that the wood has lots of little tubes going through it, lots of little spaces for air, and it makes it a very good, not a very good, but a good insulator, much, much more so than, say, like a chunk of metal. I mean, wood does not conduct nearly as good as metal. It's actually more of an insulator than it is a conductor. And then I should also mention radiation because all of these materials, you know, they, they might keep wood from, or they might keep thermal energy from traveling through them, but some of them also are very good at insulating for radiation. And so you might have heard, maybe your home has one of these, but it's called a radiant barrier. And there's ways you can sort of shield yourself from radiation. Like when it's 110 degrees outside, it's super hot, just baking. Well, if you have a radiant barrier in your home, in the ceiling or the roof, it will actually, it's just a shiny layer, it's almost like aluminum foil in your house. It's a very thin layer of shiny material. It will act just like a mirror and it will reflect a lot of the radiation that comes in from the sun. Um, so really, like if you want to insulate against radiation, you just block it. You just put something in front of it. But the best sort of insulation to radiation would be a mirror or some sort of shiny reflective surface that can just reflect it backwards from where it came. Now I should mention the best insulator known to man is a vacuum, and I'm not talking about a Hoover vacuum like you know, no, not a, not a vacuum like that, but a vacuum scientifically is a space that has no air. It's a space that has no air. And I found this patent from 1907 for a thermos, which you might have. You guys might take your, your soup or your drinks or cold beverages or something like that to school um, with a thermos, and a thermos has a double-walled system. The outside wall is what you would touch with your hands, but then inside there's another wall. It's almost like a little cavity that's sealed off from all air, and all the air is actually sucked out of it. It's an area of nothingness. There is nothing inside that area. And what's awesome about that is that in order for conduction to happen, in order for thermal energy to transfer, you have to have particles. You have to have something for the thermal energy to run into and to transfer to. But if there's nothing there, then the thermal energy can't move. And so a thermos can theoretically, at least on this part, these part of the walls, will actually like not transmit any thermal energy through conduction. It's amazing. And so here's a couple different thermoses. And then I also put a picture of space here because space is actually a gigantic vacuum. There is no air in space. There are, you know, things floating around, little particles of this and that and, and meteors and whatnot. But the thing is, is that there is no air in space. It's a gigantic vacuum. So where do we see insulators in real life? Well, you see them in a lot of places. I'm just going to mention a few just to get your mind kind of spinning on this. But first of all, if you go up into your attic, I don't know if you've ever been in your attic before, but you will see some sort of fluffy stuff. You might see this pink stuff that sort of rolls out in sheets, makes you itchy if you get it on your skin. You might see lots of like sort of powdered insulation. Some companies come in with a bale of insulation and they run it through a machine that, you know, blows it through a hose and it just fills up your attic with insulation. That's making a fluffy material that's full of air that will insulate your house from the heat that's up in the attic because the attics get super, super hot. And then you might see uh, one of these down comforters on your bed. Well, a down comforter is made up of down feathers, which come from birds, and they look like this. But they're just really, really fluffy feathers, and fluffy feathers have lots of air in them, which makes them great insulators. Are you kind of noticing a trend here with insulators? You know, anything fluffy, anything lots of air, it's a good insulator. And then a uh, solar cooker, when you're making a solar cooker, at least a panel cooker, one of the most critical points is to sort of insulate your pot. If you don't insulate the cooking pot, it's it's not going to be able to retain the heat because, see, metal is an excellent conductor. So if, you're, if your pot is made out of metal and it heats up, it's just going to conduct it into whatever it's sitting on. It's just going to, the thermal energy is going to go into it from the sun. It's going to travel through the pot and go right out into the ground. I mean, it's just not going to do a very good job or it's going to leave through the air. You know, the sun's going to hit it. It's going to heat up because it's black. But then the air, it's just going to transmit it to the air and you're going to lose it. And so you need to insulate it. And so a lot of people will take a oven bag. You can buy them for real cheap in the grocery store. But you put an oven bag around the pot 
and that creates an air layer around the pot that insulates what's inside. It keeps the thermal energy in. So the sun can pass through the bag because it's translucent. It can go through it and then heats up and the thermal energy stays in there better because of that air layer. And then finally, you've probably heard before that you're supposed to cover your pipes in the winter. You're supposed to go outside and cover up your faucets and that kind of thing because if you don't, the water inside will freeze and it will expand and end up causing a burst like this. This actually almost happened to my house last winter. I had a pipe that was exposed, forgot to cover it or didn't cover it very well, and it ended up almost bursting. I mean, the thing was like swelled up like it was about to burst and it didn't, luckily. But if it does burst, it's a it's a big mess you have to clean up. It just floods in the middle of winter. It's just, ah, oh, it's awful. And so you want to insulate the pipes with some sort of foam like this so they make coverings for your pipes. But nonetheless, in the winter, if there's a pipe that's going to get cold, that's filled with water, it has to be insulated. Well, that was your lesson on conductors and insulators. We defined what a conductor and an insulator was. Conductors are excellent transmitters of thermal energy, while insulators are more like walls for thermal energy. We also mentioned about four or five examples of each of those in the process. The best insulator is a vacuum. Science rocks. Take care.